have you ever seen anything in the Bible where things were done in an excellent manner? Are there examples in the Bible of things being done in an excellent manner? Well, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, it talks about the creation, and believe me, the creation was done in such an excellent manner that even God himself had to say, it was good, it was good, it was good, and when he got done making everything since nobody else could comment on it, he said, it was very good. <laughs> Everything that he had made, it was very good. And the way you say that in Hebrew, the way you say something is good is you say tov. But the way you say it's very good, you say tov, tov. It was very, very good. When you see the two words together, it's an intensive form. And it means it's double good or triple good or quadruple good. Anyway, our, our English Bible just says it was very good. That means it was excellent of its kind. What God had done was so excellent, nobody can match it, nobody can touch what he has made, nobody can even comprehend what he has made. The, the depth of even the natural creation is still way above the minds of natural man. Now, man through medicine and other things, they've learned principles of biology, but the more they dig, the more the more powerful the microscopes become, the more they find is built into even the very biology of a single cell. They found this strand called DNA, which is highly complex. It's like an encyclopedia of information that is in the simplest one cell organism. Where did it come from? No one can explain that. Evolution says it came through chance random processes. Well, I understand chance. In fact, we even know something about games of chance. If we would drive three hours over to Reno, we could go to the craps table. And you know, the, uh, throwing the dice, the most they've ever been recorded over at the gaming tables of so many of the same dice throw in a row is like 28 times in a row. That's the record. And, and, I may be a little bit off on that exact number, but think about it. It's less than 50 times in a row, 28 times in a row, and that's the most you can get of random processes producing the same number again and again and again and again. But if you look at the human eye, it has millions of nerves, millions of little rods and cones in the retina. It has the most incredible chemical factory in the entire body, in the retina of the eye, with all this incredible chemical reaction so that a ray of light hits one of those rods or cones in your eye. It creates a chemical reaction which sends an impulse through one of a, a billion nerves going back to the brain. And then this thing, like a cannon, biochemically has to clean itself and reload. It's just like cleaning a cannon, reloading it, but it's all happening in a split second. And all the right chemicals are there, all the right... When you look at a human eye, it is an incredible design. It has millions of parts, millions of things had to go right. Not just 28 things in a row that went right, not 28 su successive steps of the evolutionary process, what I'm telling you today is I don't care how many billions of years old you think the creation is, but there, are, there is not enough time and there is not enough randomness cannot produce what every one of us wears on our human body. Randomness, only God can produce a human eye. Only God can produce blood that clots at the right time. It doesn't just clot all at once in your body. Suppose all your blood clotted right now. Good. Ushers should have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Carry everybody out. But see, God has created things. He, what he has done is excellent of its kind, beyond human comprehension. Millions of years is not enough time to do the trillions of steps and parts that are involved in all of creation. You ever seen a bug's eye? Oh, you girls are thinking bug, yeah. Have you ever looked at a bug, you ever looked a bug in the eye and realized they're looking at you? It's kind of a weird experience to have eye-to-eye -eye contact with a bug. 
I've done that one time. I looked down at this bug like that, and I could see his eyes. He was just <laughs> looking back at me, and I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Anyway, God has created things that are excellent. He is our standard. He is our pattern of excellence in all of creation. But he's been able to pass down the spirit of excellence and transmit it to some of us. In fact, he wants it to, to give it to every one of us. But let's think about some examples. Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was sold by his brothers, taken into captivity as a slave, sold to Potiphar in Egypt. But notice what happened. Even though his brothers had betrayed him, yet the Lord was still with him. Have you ever gone through something terrible? But yet the Lord is still with you. You know, worst thing that could possibly happen to you, but the Lord is still with you. And so Joseph, in Genesis 39, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. You praise. <laughs> so Joseph was a successful man. And everything that he did, the Lord caused to prosper in his hand. Think about that. He had a spirit of excellence. He had wisdom and understanding upon him so that what he touched with his hands, he had, imagine how he started out. If you start out, how many have ever been an entry-level slave <laughs> in Egypt? Yeah. So some of us have uh, gone in at entry-level positions, um, on our job, who knows where we started out. And uh, we might be sweeping the floor or just cleaning up or doing some menial task. Well, do you think Joseph started at the top? He, was he a top slave? No, he started out as a bottom slave. So he's sweeping the floor, he's bringing in the firewood, hauling the water. And you know what they found out about Joseph? He was the best floor sweeper. He was the best water hauler. He was the best firewood person they had ever had in the house. And maybe he had to carry out the uh, bowls of, uh, well, maybe he had to carry that stuff out, the chamber pots, and, and he was the best one at doing that. And his master saw him, and his master said, you know what, this guy has ability, so I'm going to promote him in Jesus' name. So he promoted him, and then the next thing you know, he ends up being over all of Potiphar's house. And it was amazing the promotion that he received because he had the spirit of excellence upon him. He had wisdom and understanding in all that he did. Now, let me uh, bring up another person, very interesting person. Most of us cannot pronounce his name. It's in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. And his name was Bezalel. Bezalel. Everybody say that three times real quick. Bezalel. Bezalel. Okay. And here's what um, the Lord spoke to Moses. Because Moses had been given the pattern of the tabernacle to construct. He'd seen in a vision up on Mount Sinai. He'd seen the tabernacle. But someone had to build this. And Moses said, I can't build it, Lord. I'm, I'm the prophet. I have the vision. I have the blueprint for it. But I don't know how to build it. So the Lord said, see, I've called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I've filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Now listen to this guy's resume. Resume. He could design artistic works and work in gold, in silver, in bronze. That's all kind of metalworking. In cutting jewels for setting. So he was a, like a diamond cutter, a jewel cutter. He was also expert in carving wood and in all manner of workmanship. And the Bible even goes on to say they did embroidery. They had to embroider the high priest's garments. They had to embroider the... Uh, veil that was between the various parts of the sanctuary. And so this one guy had the spirit of God upon him. He had such a spirit of excellence that he knew how to do all those things. Uh, Thomas Kincaid, for example, is famous for painting. But it doesn't say he works in metal. 
that he cuts jewels, that he carves wood, and that he does all these other things. He's kind of like, as good as he is, he is excellent in painting. Now, he may do all the other stuff on the side, but uh, I'm not aware of him selling his artistic works in any other area other than his paintings. But Bezalel, this guy could do a little bit of everything and do it very, very well. Have you ever seen um, pictures of, or maybe seen the King Tut exhibit? Anybody seen the King Tut exhibit? Uh, a, a few of you have. And you know the fine quality workmanship that came out of Egypt. And so these guys were able to do the equivalent work the equivalent level and probably better because they had the Lord with them to do, to create this beautiful tabernacle that God had and to sculpt and to cast and to do all of these things. He had a spirit of excellence upon him. He had an amazing resume. And so God, that same spirit that was on Bezalel, I believe is still available today through the Holy Spirit where we can be multifaceted in what we are able to do. We can have a resume that's not just in one area, but we can go from area to area to area. And if we're willing to learn, have the time to learn, I believe that God can make us excellent in what we do. That there is a spirit of excellence that rests upon us because we have access to something the world does not have. Egypt does not have access to the Holy Spirit like we do as the children of God. And so we have an indwelling teacher. He's called the teacher. He's called the comforter. He's the one who can instruct us. By the way, how did Jesus do all the things that he did? Was he not instructed? Was he not an apprentice to a carpenter named Joseph for a season? And when Joseph evidently passed away because after Jesus' childhood, there's no more record of him, was Jesus still not an apprentice to a carpenter? His father? He said, the things that I do, I only do what my father has shown me to do. See, Jesus was still an apprentice to a carpenter, the carpenter of creation, even while he was walking on the earth. See, there was an anointing upon Jesus. He was still learning. He was still growing. We'll talk about that in... I'll give you a couple verses. Actually, look in Mark 7, 37. You might want to mark this in your Bible. Mark 7, verse 37. And it says this. The people had seen what Jesus had done. And it said, and they were astonished beyond measure. In other words, how would we say that today? They were flabbergasted. They were, you know, what words would we use? amazed, dumbfounded. I can't believe it. OMG. <laughs> and they said, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. You know, I've been talking to the carpenter of creation. How do you fix ears, Father? How do you fix tongues that don't work? How do you fix people whose limbs are withered? See, he studied at the feet of the carpenter of creation, and he learned. And his father taught him how to pray, how to transmit the power of God. Jesus was an amazing person. But I love this. I remember reading this years ago. It said, he has done all things well. Well, do we not have the Spirit of Christ? Amen. Do we not have the Spirit of doing all things well living within us? Is Jesus Christ living big within you today? Are you doing all things well? Just a thought. Just a thought. Luke 2.52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. He was always growing, always learning, always going to another level. Now, I believe walking in a spirit of excellence requires us to have the right attitude. Would you not agree? Part of this is our attitude towards our work, towards what we're doing. What are we doing with the works of our hands? And I remember being impacted <clears throat> years ago by this verse in Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24, and it tells us how to be good employees. 
It says bond servant, I mean employees. <laughs> it says servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. How many of you ever just, just polish stuff to make it kind of look good, but you weren't really cleaning it, you were just kind of uh, dressing it a little bit, where if somebody walked in there, oh yeah, that job was done. Um, I, in the fraternity house when I was in college, my job on the weekends was to go around and clean the restrooms, clean the restrooms. But I would go in and do things with eye service as a man pleaser. All I did was I looked for the, the worst stuff in the bathroom. I picked up all the paper towels around the ground. Guys are messy, you know, and there'd be paper towels all around the trash can. So I'd pick them up, stuff them in there, and then I'd grab some of those paper towels and I'd polish the chrome on the faucets. That was it. I call that cleaning the bathroom. Because if some, I figured if somebody walked in and saw the chrome shining, they would figure it was clean. That was just my strategy, you know. I didn't really clean the bathroom. I just kind of was a man pleaser. You know, I just did some stuff that looked good to the eye and then left it at that. But that's not what the Lord is talking about. He says, in sincerity of heart, Fearing God, that's how we're to do things. In sincerity of heart, fearing God, having reverence for God. He says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. How many work for men? That's a trick question. How many work for the Lord? While you're working for men. Okay, so we're to do things as unto the Lord, even though we may have a human supervisor or boss or someone who's paying the bills, nevertheless, we are working for the Lord so that there can be a difference between the children of Israel and the children of this world or the children of you know, us as Christians and the people of this world. There needs to be a difference, but I have to adjust my attitude in order to work as unto the Lord. So I love this scripture. He says, and knowing that from the Lord, when you do it his way, working unto the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. What is the inheritance? It's Holy Spirit. When you work as unto the Lord, in the, even if it's sweeping the floor, if you do it unto the Lord, you will receive a reward on the inside in your spirit man as well as outwardly for having done a good job. And you know, God's inheritance means we're walking in our divine destiny and our purpose. We get to find out what God actually created us for. You know, when you're in your 20s, you're just kind of trying to find what God wanted me to do, you know, and kind of get into the right area uh, for career and usually, you know, in getting married or something like that. But when you're like in your 30s, between 30 and 40, you're testing your skill levels. You're learning, you're trying to find out, how good am I? And most of the time when you're in your 30s, we're using our own resources. We're not really open to a lot of input from other people. We're testing to see how good we can do it on our own and by ourselves. Now, if you're in a certain job, you may be forced to receive input from others. But a lot of times, we are testing our own abilities. And then by the time we're 40, we found out what we can do, or at least, you know, what we can do, what we're good at, and the limits of our knowledge and the limits of our ability. We have started to find out, okay, I'm good at this, but over here in this area, I'm not so good, and so now I'm ready to receive advice from people who have been down that road and done that before because I realize, you know, I'm confident in what I'm good at, but now I'm open to the things, to receiving instruction on the things I'm not so good at. Does this make sense to anybody? How many were that way in your 30s? You're just kind of doing stuff. I, I love what one pastor said. He said, I was a pastor before I was 40, but he said, I didn't have no sense. He said, I had a lot of zeal, but I didn't have no sense. He said, when I became 40, then I started to get some wisdom to go along with my zeal. Amen. 
So, what I'm saying to you is, when you're out working in the world, would God approve of the way you're doing what you're doing? Do you ask him? He's your, really the one who's looking over your shoulder. He lives within you. Are you satisfied in your conscience that you're doing the best job you can possibly do? Or are you merely pleasing men? I mean, some people are asking the question, how little do I have to do to get by? To keep from losing my job? In other words, some people are trying to figure out how much can I do, and other people are trying to figure out what is the bare minimum that I can do to keep my job. And so there's, there's an attitude adjustment here. And those of you who are employers, you can tell, you can spot the ones that are just trying to skate by and do as little as possible. <clears throat> I remember I was working in a place one time, and we had this one guy. He always would sit on this five-gallon bucket. You know, you can turn a five-gallon bucket upside down and sit on it. And he would just sit on the bucket most of the time. Seriously. I mean, it was, it was funny. You know, where is he? Well, he's over on the bucket. You know, he's just sitting there. <laughs> the rest of us are doing stuff, and he's just kind of sitting there. You know, it was, it was kind of funny in a way because it's like he didn't get it. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it, it's just different people are in different places when it comes to work. And I believe that if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, that we're going to use that strength in what we're doing. I'll never forget, I was on a job site. I was hired as a day worker one time. I was kind of in between jobs, but I was at a temp agency. They sent us out to a tire warehouse. And I think we we're unloading a semi-load of tires. And there's like four or five of us there, and we're supposed to unload this truck. The only problem was we're there, but the truck was not. So we're waiting on the truck. The truck's supposed to be there any moment. So the guy who owns the shop says, uh, okay, some of you guys, there's five of us sitting on buckets, you know, we're sitting on chairs. <clears throat> and he says, um, I need some of you guys to sweep the floor. So a couple of us got brooms and swept a little bit. You know, the, you know how you can sweep a floor, just find the big pieces and kind of get them, but ignore the corners. How many clean the corners? How many don't clean the corners? How many wish there weren't corners? <laughs> But anyway, you know, I'm bored and I'm sitting there and time goes faster if you're working. So uh, we cleaned that one room and I'm working unto the Lord because I'd read this stuff in the Bible. And I thought, I am working unto the Lord. I don't, you know, I don't know who this guy is and I'll never see him again in my life probably. So I'm working unto the Lord and we, we finished the one room. Well, the truck still wasn't here. So I took the broom into the next room. And that's where I started to make my mistake because now I'm sweeping up the next room. I'm going beyond what the boss has asked us to do. And so some of the other guys I'm working with, they said, hey, you over there, stop that. You're making us look bad. <laughs> well, I'm working under the Lord. So I just kept on sweeping. Finally, one of them said, well, I'm not going to look bad okay. just sitting here. So he grabbed a broom and we, we swept the other room, you know, because it, and then the truck came and we were able to unload the trailer. But you see what I'm saying? There is a difference if you're serving God and doing stuff unto God, even if it's the most menial job, we can do things unto the Lord and we're going to receive the reward of the inheritance. Because I believe the attitude with which you do even the most menial task is going to be the attitude with which you do the most important task. Because you're either doing it unto the Lord or you're just kind of trying to skate by. So if we're doing it unto the Lord, I believe we need to have a spirit of excellence about us so that there is a difference between the children of God and the children of this world. A noticeable difference. Now Jesus talked about this. <clears throat> he said in the Sermon on the Mount, how many love the Sermon on the Mount? How many obey the Sermon on the Mount? Don't raise your hand too quick. There's some pretty powerful stuff in there. <laughs> Because he said, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, pray for those who um, despitefully use you and persecute you, and so on. So there's some really, really strong stuff. You have to be committed to actually fulfill the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 41, he said, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Now what is that all about? Well, in those days, a Roman soldier could say, hey, you, carry my backpack up to the 7-Eleven. 
And so, because he's a Roman soldier and the Romans had authority over the Jews in those days, you would carry his backpack. But because you were a Jew and because you hated the Romans, you were probably grumbling and griping the whole time, thinking, who, is, who does this Roman think he is? But Jesus said, don't have that attitude. He said, how can this guy tell me what to do? He's from another country. But Jesus said, have the attitude. If he asks you to carry the backpack one mile, put a smile on your face and then say, you know what? I'd be glad to carry it another mile. Where are we going next? Where are you going next? I'll carry it for you. And have a different attitude. See, that's a radical different attitude. Going with a person a second mile. They asked you to do one thing. And Jesus said, go with them twice as far. To make a difference between the children of God and the children of this world. Are you getting, are you getting this? See, we are not the same as everybody else. Why do we act the same as everybody else? We are called to be different. We have God living on the inside of us. We have to be God inside minded that we are different. We are carrying the name of Christ as a Christian. So we have to operate in a different spirit than the spirit of the world. We are different kinds of people. We are not the same. We have been born again of God. We have the life of God, the spirit of God within us. The very blood of Jesus. He poured out his blood so that his life could come on the inside of us and transform us from the inside out. Greatest miracle of all is the miracle of new birth to have a dead human spirit made into a living human spirit in contact with Almighty God. Amen. But our flesh is lazy. Sometimes we're just trying to skate by. Just do as little as we can. But that doesn't impress God and it doesn't impress man. And we can do so much better than that. Now, I'm not talking, when I'm talking about having a spirit of excellence, I'm not talking about becoming a slave to perfectionism. Some of us have that perfectionistic tendency and we can get carried away over something so small that nobody else would even know what it is we're trying to perfect. We're working on some little thing that only we know about and everybody else thinks we're done with the job and yet we're still fiddling with some little thing. Now that might be important in brain surgery. <laughs> might be vital. But we, we had a guy in the church um, years ago who was a surgery tech, and he used to have to tell these surgeons, doctor, that's good enough. The more you're messing with that stitch and the more you're messing with that, the worse you're going to make it. That's good enough. Reality is you've done your job. Now sew them up so they can come back to life. You know, and so sometimes people can get carried away even to an extreme, even a, a doctor in an operating room and they need a reality check. So some people, some of us beavers tend to get, we're so perfectionistic, we're trying to make everything perfect where sometimes 95% is good enough. And don't waste four hours trying to get the next 5%. Brother Lee had to cure me of that when we were building the office building. <coughs> So I'm trying to line the, you know, we're putting the, the uh, trusses up there and I've got my tape measure out and I'm trying to get it exact. And he says, Mike, nail it down. They'll never see that from a galloping horse. <laughs> <laughs> he probably remembers that. He had to work with me. He's had to work with me a lot. So I'm trying to get it right. Okay. <laughs> but you know, some stuff you just need to do it and not get overly consumed with, you know, the 16th of an inch. <laughs> also, when we're pursuing a spirit of excellence, <clears throat> many of us have received, all of us in fact, have received abilities, gifts, and talents as the gift of God. But sometimes we think, and you hear people say, well, I'm a self-made person. <laughs> you know, I have done this. I have built this business. I have taught myself how to, you know, I've learned this trade mostly by my own efforts and so on. But what, what did you start out with? What were you born with? You were born with a, a couple of hands and 
of some motor skills and some ability to do the math in order for the whatever it is that you're trying to build or construct or whatever it is. In other words, God has given us a starter set of gifts that we have begun to work with. One of the smartest guys that ever lived, the Apostle Paul, wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. He says, what do you have that God hasn't given you? Is there anything that we have that we didn't, you know, we were born with stuff. We might be self-made person, but self-made doesn't really, once you start thinking about it in this way, that everything we have is a gift from God. Well, and Paul went on to say, and if everything you have is from God, why are you boasting as though it were not a gift? Now that teaches us true humility to remember that no matter how good we may become or proficient at a given task or a given skill, that the talents that we have and the abilities we have came from God and they're enhanced by the Holy Spirit now that we're a Christian. It's not about us. It's about God operating through us to bring praise to His glory. See, our job is to become channels of the Holy Spirit in whatever it is that we happen to be doing in such a way that, that our work shows or God's work shows through us and people can say, who did this work? This work is of excellent quality. I remember living in an old hotel in um, Missoula, Montana. And the hotel was being remodeled and so um, I had to pull some of the baseboard off. And it was amazing, you know, if any of you um, guys have worked around old buildings, the wood that they used in those days was like not hole free. I mean, <clears throat> it was perfect wood. But in the corners where the baseboard would meet, the carpenters, the finish workers, had taken a knife and they had cut a little projecting tang of wood that would overlap on top of the next baseboard at the corner. The, the two didn't meet in a miter joint. There was an overlap that went over it that actually hid the crack that a miter joint leaves. It was a standard of excellence that I had never seen before and I've never seen since. Now I realize there are probably carpenters and woodworkers that know how to do that kind of stuff, but in today's economy, most people don't have time and their <clears throat> general contractor would not allow them to go to that extra effort to cut those little things out. I don't know how they did it. Maybe they could just put it on a grinding wheel and, and grind that curve in there, but it was a special mark of craftsmanship that you could see in the woodworking. And some of you that have maybe worked, if anybody's ever worked to restore an older building, you know what I'm talking about. There is stuff there that the guys in the old time, they took a lot of care and individual skill to hand carve out things and to do things that we in our fast paced society don't have time to do. But there was a spirit of excellence and you see signs of it in different places, sometimes where you least expect to find it. Another thing about our attitude adjustment is in order to be a person of excellence, we have to remain flexible in the ways in which we do things. Because if you're not flexible, you, you're not willing to receive instruction. Uh, I've learned kind of the hard way that there, there are more than one way to, do, uh, to accomplish a given task. There is more than one way to do it. Now there's my way, which is right, the right way. <laughs> but then some other people have come up with other ways. And when you really, if I want to be honest about it and stop and think about it, maybe it's a better way than my way, or maybe it's just equal with my way. They just do it a different way. But when we, to work with other people, you have to learn to become flexible and sometimes that means even undoing something that you have already done in order to achieve a higher purpose of doing it better. I remember one time I uh, repaired a wall and I had, uh, this was when I did not have any electric tools. And I did everything with a handsaw and it wasn't really all that sharp. And so I was uh, ripping some pine boards by hand and it was taking a long time and my shoulder was getting, you know, your shoulder gets sore after a while of, of sawing and, and I got it all done. 
And then the Holy Spirit brought me a revelation I did not want to receive. <laughs> now this was just a test. God tests us every once in a while. He said, okay, now that you've gotten that done, now I want you to take that stuff down and put it on this wall. Now that's, that's where I blew up. I said, if you wanted it on that wall, why didn't you tell me before I put it on this wall? You know, because my shoulder, because I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to have to go through this whole process all over again. So it was humility, remaining flexible, remaining pliable, even when something didn't really make sense. It was a lesson for me. It had nothing to do with the wood or the wall. It was a lesson for my heart to learn that sometimes, even though you do the best that you can do on a certain thing, sometimes you have to undo it and redo it. And just because we've done it and got it done doesn't mean the project is over. There might be an improvement. How many men, let me just ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hands. How many have ever helped your wife arrange the furniture in the living room? No, don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. Well, some guys are raising two hands. And then she looks at this. Now, some are pointing at their husbands. That's not good. Maybe he's the furniture arranger. And you think, okay, good. Man, I helped her. I moved that sofa. I moved the bookcase. I moved all the stuff. I'm good. I'm going to go sit down and rest. And then she says, now, wait a minute. On second thought... Let's put the bookcase over here. Let's try that. What do you mean try? <laughs> Just figure it out on a piece of paper. When you figure it out where you want it, I will move it one time. I'm not going to move it ten times. But that's not the way life is, is it? We have to remain flexible. Flexible. How many feel like you're just kind of loosening up here? You're getting a little flexibility going in your spirit. So if someone asks you to do something you thought was already done to redo it, that you're going to be patient and loving and kind and rearrange the furniture if it takes 10 times. <laughs> or you end up putting it back where it was before because it doesn't seem to fit any other way. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. That's all part of a spirit of excellence. In fact, let me show you the more Excellent way. Let me give you a scripture, by the way. James 3, verse 17. Aha, uh -huh, this is a good one to see in black and white. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. All those three are good, but that's not where I'm going. The next three words are where I'm going. Willing to yield. You know what the yield sign means? If nobody's coming, you can go through. But if somebody is coming, then you have to slow down and wait for them. Willing to yield. Now that's wisdom. He says, the wisdom that is from above is willing to yield in some cases. Not yield our, our standards. Not yield our integrity. But in working with people, we have to be willing to yield. Does it really matter whether it's your way or their way when you're trying to accomplish the job? and both ways will be equally successful. It doesn't really matter whose way you're doing it as long as you get the job done, right? Willing to yield. So instead of having, no, we're doing it this way, no, we're doing it this way, no. Why waste all the time? If someone has the wisdom that comes from above, they're willing to yield and go forward and get the job done. Or everybody, everybody can go to lunch. You know, oh, I need to get the job done. <laughs> walking in love is walking in excellence. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, it says, Paul said this, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. What is that more excellent way? Well, he spends a whole chapter, chapter 13, explaining how to walk in love, that that is a more excellent way. <clears throat> in verse 8 of that same chapter 13, he says, love never fails. You ever sometimes have the issue, man, how do I, how do I speak to this person? How, what do I do? Um, I'm not quite sure what to do in this situation. Well, try love. Love never fails. Walk in love. 
it never fails. It is a more excellent way. When in doubt, walk in love, and when not in doubt, walk in love. Amen. And we got everything covered. You know, excellence begins in the church, I believe. I believe when we do stuff for the Lord, that we should do it in an excellent manner. The best that we can possibly do. Because why do you want, why would anyone want to give God their leftovers or their just kind of a warmed over effort? You know, when we, when we do stuff for the Lord, we're, we're working as unto Him. How much more should we bring excellence into the church, into everything that we do? We need to give God our best. I don't want to give God second best. I want to give Him my best. And I don't know how you are, but I believe when we do that, when we set that standard, I am going to give God my best, that same attitude that we have on Sunday, it's going to trickle over to Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday because it is an attitude change where we are willing for once in our lives to do our very best for the Lord. Now, we may be frustrated with people. We may be frustrated with our employer. But, you know, there is one person who has never done us wrong in all our lives, and we can surely do our best for the Lord, working unto Him. And when we learn to do our best for God, I believe that's going to spill over and cause us to be prosperous people in every area of our life. Just like Joseph was a prosperous person, but he started as an entry-level slave. But he worked his way up. And Potiphar trusted him because of his integrity, his work ethic, the quality of performance that he had. Not that he had to be perfect in everything, but because he gave it his best in whatever he did. Now, we're not all equally talented. And look, give it your best. Do the best that you can. In fact, everybody raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Now raise it a little higher. See, y'all can do that. See, you can do more. See, we raise our hand, but we can raise it a little bit higher. I saw those elbows straighten out. So those hands went up. See, we can do a little bit more than what we've been doing. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 14, 12. He was actually talking about spiritual gifts, but he makes a point which is very, very powerful. He says, even so you... Since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. We had a teacher in the church years ago named Tom Mannion. And he had on his license plate the word seek, the number two, and then XL. Seek to excel. He got a license plate out of the word of God. Only Tom could have pulled that off. It's amazing. Maybe, maybe some of you have a, a custom license plate. But you know, let it be for the edification of the church that we seek to excel. God has called us to seek to excel, to go above, to go beyond, to go the second mile. You know, if we do these things, I believe the believer is going to be ten times better than the worldly person. Don't you like that? Just ten times better? That's scriptural. By the way, turn to Daniel chapter 1. Ten times better. Daniel and his friends were taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar out of Babylon. And the kings in those days, they would gather the cream of the crop. They would take all the people of ability and talent and the young people... And Nebuchadnezzar would bring them back to Babylon, retrain them, and then use them in his government. It's kind of an interesting concept that he had. But Daniel and his friends, they're young men, and they're in the king's employ, and they're allotted a certain amount of food, which came from the king's table, and a certain amount of wine. Now, some of the things that the king the heathen king ate was not kosher for them as Jewish people to eat. So they asked the eunuch who was in charge of them to say, hey, listen, we do not want to eat the king's meat and drink the king's wine, which might have even been offered to demon gods. We don't know for sure. So they asked for that. And the, the eunuch said, what are, you, what are you guys doing? You trying to get me in trouble? 
Because if you don't eat right and you start getting really thin and gaunt looking and, uh, you, you know, you'll be anemic and then the king is going to get on my case for not having taken care of you. And Daniel said, wait a minute, let's try something. For 10 days, let us eat just vegetables and drink water. And after 10 days, you take a look at us and see how we look. So they ate vegetables and water for 10 days and they looked better than all the other people around them. The blessing of God was on them. And by the way, a vegetarian diet isn't bad. It's, it has a lot of health benefits. So they ate that way, and they were very successful. And notice here in verse 17, then they were brought in before the king. It says, and as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king himself interviewed them, and among them, among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Ten times better. That's achievable. Because we have the Spirit of God. Daniel stood for what was right. He stood for the law of his God, that he not eat anything that would defile him according to the law as he understood it. And God honored him and blessed him with wisdom and understanding and made him ten times smarter than all the other people. How many think that's cool? How many want to be ten times smarter? How many just want to be a vegetable? You know, hopefully nobody. Amen. So, what am I saying? Excellence brings promotion. It brings us favor with God and with man. If you'll turn over to Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, one final verse. We'll see what happened to Daniel. Daniel 6, verse 3 says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Daniel ended up being the prime minister of Babylon, almost like Joseph ended up being second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. Why? Because he had an excellent spirit in him. The spirit of excellence was in Daniel, and it brings promotion. How many need an attitude adjustment this morning? Anybody? Y'all have perfect that? Oh, feel the, okay. We need to adjust attitudes right now. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' mighty name, if you...